Oh, Jesus. This is what happens. This is what happens when you're a bitch with wings. <laughs> Hi, I'm Abby. I have a lot of records, and this is Vinyl Monday Season 3. So welcome back, or welcome if this is your first time here. Vinyl Monday is the series where once a week I sit down and just talk about a classic album I love. If 30 minute episodes aren't your thing, don't worry. I also do Vinyl Monday in 60 seconds, both here on my channel and over on my Instagram. We are kicking off season three today. I cannot believe I am on my third year of doing this. I'm coming off a week-long break, feeling refreshed and ready to attack this thing. But first, a couple announcements. On where I've been, I went home for two weeks. I caught up on my sewing project. I touched grass. It was wonderful. Secondly, I've been doing this thing for months and have literally been too busy to mention it here. My best friend Jack does an American Top 40 style show over on Mixcloud. He puts together little weekly radio shows of vintage pop weekly charts from 1957, I think, to 1970. He's been at this for a while and he's on 1962. In January of 62, a few months ago our time, a familiar face, or voice joined the show. I voiced some bumpers. You should totally go listen to the show. It's only gotten better with time and the link is in my description. Announcement time over. We are celebrating this album's 30th birthday this week. The first album of Vinyl Monday season three is in Utero by Nirvana. Congrats to those who guessed this one. Remember, if you want to play along, all you gotta do is check out my community tab. That's where I post hints to what next week's album is gonna be. I host polls. You can find that on my channel. Brief pause. Is this left wing, right wing, broken wing not genius? I thought it was genius. All right, let's take the plastic off. So my copy is a repress. This is the most recent general sale vinyl run of In Utero, I think. Uh, there is a run of the 20th anniversary mix out there. This is not that. This is the standard mix, standard vinyl, what you would get if you walked into a bookstore. I have a quote here by our buddy Chris that relates to the In Utero art really well. He said, in Utero is a testament to the artistic vision of Kurt Cobain. If you look at Kurt's paintings and his drawings, In Utero is a good representation of what he liked in art and how he expressed himself. If you look at Kurt's art, he found beauty in the dark, the disturbing, and the weird, for lack of a better term. This album art is the summation of that. Kurt always had a fascination with dolls, the human body, and human anatomy. He found this store in the mall that sold medical tools, so when he got rich and famous, he'd go there and buy up, like, medical charts and mannequins, like the one we see here. Throughout the back cover and this insert, we have illustrations by Alex Gray, and this collage we see on the back cover was done by Kurt Cobain. He had Charles Peterson come over to his house and photograph this. He made this on his living room carpet. He wasn't much for conventional art supplies see what he varnished his paintings with sometimes. So instead, he'd find these objects in his travels and make art out of them. I don't have this image on the vinyl cover, but we do see it on this insert. This woman down here was Frances Bean's nanny. I don't know how this photo came to be, but I do know that Kurt brought it in and wanted it incorporated into the art somehow. So on the original release, it became the image on the CD. On In Utero, we have Kurt Cobain on vocals, guitar, and serving as principal lyricist, Chris Novoselic on bass, and Dave Grohl on drums. We have a special guest on this one, Kara Shaley does cello on Dumb and All Apologies. In Utero was produced by Steve Albini, Roll the first transition of season three. 
All right, so I'm going to put a brief pause on the fun here. Please allow for this tonal shift. There's going to be a few in this video. By nature of the stories surrounding and the themes of this record, including addiction, mental illness, sexual assault, and suicide, this is going to be a heavy episode. If any of those topics mean that you can't stick around with us today, that's okay. You can come back next week or the 60 second version of this video uh, that's free of all of those topics. You can watch that instead if you wish. Everyone, please take care of yourselves. I don't want you harming yourselves for the sake of a silly music history video by some bitch wearing wings. And we're back to the video. Back in September of 1991, a little album called Nevermind ruined grunge for everybody, especially Nirvana. Yes, I'm holding it like this. I don't want the YouTube Terms of Service gods or the Nirvana baby himself to smite me. A very similar thing happened with Shoegaze across the pond because of a little album called Loveless, but that's for the Suwaki episode. We're dumb Americans, so we get to talk about grunge. By July of 92, Nirvana is thoroughly sick of, even embarrassed, of Nevermind and is seriously considering a follow-up. The guys rule out having Butch Vig produce again. They felt he made Nevermind sound too pop. They wanted to go back to their punk roots. They consider Jack and Dino. He produced their first record, Bleach, and they cut some demos with him in October of 92. A couple other guys are in the running too, but Nirvana eventually decides on Steve Albini. Why? Because he produced the Pixies' Surfer Rosa and Nirvana worshipped the Pixies. It was time to shake things up, so going into the third record, they wanted to dismantle what the second had built. It's important to remember that Nirvana was a counterculture group that entered the mainstream virtually overnight. They were touring non-stop. How non-stop? Nirvana played over a hundred shows on four continents in less than five months. And you can tell, going into the third LP, Kurt's voice was shot. The guys debuted the material for what would become In Utero as far back as 91 and were regularly adding it to their sets throughout 92. Of course, we can't forget about the incredible fake out where Nirvana went live on MTV and played the beginning of Rate Me before Lithium. One thing about Nirvana that you've got to know is that if you tell them not to do something, they're gonna want to do it even more. Yes, this was the same broadcast where Chris accidentally clobbers himself in the head with his bass. Amazing. No one took Nirvana less seriously than Nirvana. Now all this singing and screaming and flinging himself into drum kits only aggravated Kurt's stomach issues. The man survived on a steady diet of Kraft mac and cheese because it was the only thing the poor guy could digest. The band's schedule was so packed that he couldn't go see a doctor, so he turned to heroin to self-medicate. And he was rich now, so he had the money to go on five-day benders. Dave and Chris are no doubt also struggling with this very sudden ascent to fame. It just seemed to manifest the hardest with Kurt. Kurt looked up to another biggest band in the world. However, unlikely it seems, the Beatles. He was particularly enamored with John Lennon, equal parts musician, activist, and thinker. He wanted to emulate that, prickly wife included. Enter Courtney Love. Oh lord. Oh man. I have made it through two whole seasons of this Vinyl Monday nonsense without having to mention Courtney Love. I was dreading this day. All right, big spoiler alert for season three. There will be a live through this 30th anniversary episode. It's not anytime soon, but I just want you to prepare yourselves for it. If you think that I'm going easy on her in this video, it's because this video isn't about her. It's about Nirvana. So I'm going to be talking about Courtney in the context of her close relationship with this band. Make no mistake, Kurt and Courtney had a toxic codependent relationship. 
They were both addicts. They enabled the shit out of each other. And they spiraled even deeper into their addictions because of each other. But you have to understand what he saw in her. How does one describe Courtney Love? In his mind, she came to him in his darkest hour when he was doing so much heroin that he couldn't think, let alone practice guitar. He saw a confident, strong-willed, take no sh woman. She's crass, she's loud, she's unabashedly herself. That sounds like somebody familiar. She truly didn't give a f about what anyone thought about her, and Kurt loved that. He wanted to be like that too, and they both came from broken homes, so he felt seen. He saw her as his artistic equal, truly his other half. She was undoubtedly the muse of this album. As much as we would all like to, we cannot talk about In Utero without talking about Courtney Love. A decent chunk of In Utero's material was written in this perverted domestic bliss. See Heart Shaped Box, which was written either in their closet or their bathtub. It depends on who you ask. You also have to remember that the media at the time was awful to Courtney. Was some of it deserved? Sure, she can be a real asshole. But did she deserve Vanity Fair running an article during her pregnancy, uh, defaming her by saying she was doing drugs while pregnant? Absolutely not. She quit using for a time when she discovered she was pregnant. Frances Bean being born perfectly healthy was proof of that. Kurt was pissed about the Vanity Fair article. He was pissed that the media was treating the woman he loved this way, pissed that no one was giving her a chance, not even his own band. Uh, again, was Nirvana's contempt towards her justified? Yeah. Dave's always been pretty open about his ire for Courtney. You curl your hair. You don't like it? It's nicer when it's straight because it doesn't make your face look so round. Oh my god! Uh, uh, yeah. I was on stage. And he said that on the mic. I may not like her either, but it'd be ludicrous to say she isn't a wonderful artist. The Vanity Fair article caused Kurt and Courtney to lose custody of Francis for the first seven months of her life. Kurt got paranoid. He isolated himself and did less and less interviews with the press. This onslaught from all sides only made him love Courtney harder out of sheer defiance. This was hella toxic. Although it's worth noting that this wariness of the press meant that fucking Nardwar was the last person to interview Kurt Cobain, which like, that's pretty awesome, honestly. The working title was I Hate Myself and Want to Die, so... There's that. And this title made it pretty far in the process. Kurt insisted that it was a joke, but Chris was like, Dude, we can't have a record called I Hate Myself and Wanna Die. No one's gonna wanna sell it and we're gonna get sued. Instead, Kurt picked In Utero from a line of a poem that Courtney wrote while she was pregnant. In Utero was recorded at Pachyderm Studio in Minnesota, just outside the Twin Cities. The whole thing was recorded in about a week. Some of these songs were recorded in just one go, according to Dave. But what's astonishing, really, is that Kurt cut all of his vocal tracks in about six hours. Steve describes there not being much banter in the studio. Kurt would play a riff, the guys would jam on it, boom, that's a song. Kurt was focused and sober through production, his thoughts were organized, and as much as he hated soloing, he did a little bit for the record. Once the album was complete, David Geffen was unsure about releasing it. In the execs' minds, it was way too rough around the edges for rock radio, a huge risk that might not reap the same reward as Nevermind. And there was a song on the record called Rate Me. No doubt people would get pissed off about that before even hearing it. But I guess they came to their senses, realizing that Nirvana was the star of the label. Not releasing this uh, would be worse off for everyone. It'd be 94 by the time they could put out a re-recorded in utero. That was way too long a wait than anyone was comfortable with. But Nirvana did have three of the songs remixed. Kurt did some overdubs, and the guys had Scott Litt 
Remix, Heart Shaped Box, Penny Royalty, and All Apologies. A notable show of this era that I want to spotlight is the Mia Zapata Benefit Concert. In July of 1993, singer of the Gits Mia Zapata was raped and killed on her way home. The police didn't do sh** to solve her murder, so the Seattle music scene banded together to hold a benefit concert in August. The funds would go to hiring a PI to solve her case. Nirvana was on the bill and they played one of the best sets of this period in their career. For a long time, this was considered a holy grail Nirvana show. They played some of the in utero material before the record was out, and it was assumed that there was no video. That is, until like six weeks ago, when some random guy just uploaded their entire set to YouTube. That will be linked in the description. Consider that your extra credit for today. You know, as much as the internet may suck, I do love it sometimes. The track listing for In Utero goes as follows. <laughs> Opening up In Utero, we have Serve the Servants, followed by Scentless Apprentice, then Heart Shaped Box, next Rate Me, then Frances Farmer will have her revenge on Seattle, and side one closes with dumb. Opening up side two, we have Very Ape, followed by Penny Royalty, then Radio Friendly Unit Shifter, next Tourette's, and the album closes with all apologies. In Utero was released on September 21st, 1993, 30 years ago this week. Heart Shaped Box was released as the promo single in August. Nirvana was no stranger to controversy. If you're here, you know that much. They delighted in pissing people off, and the Heart Shaped Box video was one of their bigger controversies. It was directed by Anton Corbin, who was himself working under a detailed outline by Kurt. People lost their minds over some pretty stark imagery of a little girl in KKK robes reaching for hanged fetuses in trees while an old man in a Santa hat slash Pope hat is crucified in the background. MTV aired it anyway because Nirvana practically owned them at this point. Nirvana paid MTV's bills. There was a bit of legal trouble too over Kevin Kerslocky, who directed the In Bloom video, claiming that Kurt and Corbin had stolen the concept for the Heart Shaped Box video from him, but this was all settled. Despite this hiccup, In Utero was a smash success, debuting at number one. Not even Nevermind did this. It made people People demand even more Nirvana. Even Axl Rose, who'd gotten in a fight with Kurt at the 92 VMAs, asked Nirvana to go on tour with Guns N' Roses. But Nirvana didn't take many of these opportunities because Kurt was visibly unwell. In December of 93, while Kurt is going through another withdrawal period, Nirvana plays MTV Unplugged. If you want to have a good chuckle, keep an eye on Dave, trying so hard not to just wail on those drums the entire time. This is a lovely set. I know everyone talks about the Bowie cover, but I always loved the Vaseline's cover and the Lead Belly cover. This demand for more Nirvana took a toll. Kurt was in a bad way during their Europe tour in 94, both physically and mentally. In February, he'd become paranoid that Courtney was cheating on him with one Billy Corgan of Smashing Pumpkins who was on tour in Europe supporting Siamese Dream at the same time Nirvana was on tour. Kurt confronts her about it and ends the Europe tour less than halfway through its scheduled run. Kurt didn't see Courtney for two months after this fight, so he books a five-star hotel in Rome to make amends. He picked Rome because she loved Roman history. He bought her roses and champagne, even a piece of the Colosseum, but after another fight, he attempted suicide for the first time. Courtney brought him home and staged an intervention with Chris in attendance. 
He agreed to go to rehab, and so did Courtney, but after a few days, his intrusive thoughts got so intense that he escaped the treatment facility. In the first three to 12 months after a suicide attempt, you're most at risk for another. This was Kurt. He attempted suicide a second time and succeeded. Thus In Utero was the last studio album Nirvana put out. Penny Royalty was supposed to be the next single, but they quickly shelved it. Rock radio after Nirvana's breakup was interesting. I've taken to calling this the Kurt effect. Hordes were imitating his voice to begin with. That continued well after 94. These guys sang about all the same big feelings Kurt did, just not with his songwriting prowess. So you got super cheese like Bush. And this was the state of rock radio here in the States for like 10 years after Kurt died. His loss caused a power vacuum so big that we got f***ing stained. I wanted to end this chapter on a somewhat happier note before we get into the heaviest sh of this video. Uh, remember the Benefit concert? In 2004, 11 years after Mia Zapata's murder, her killer was caught. Though the concert funds dried up after a few years, they did help solve her murder. So, what do I think of In Utero? What I don't like about other reviews of In Utero <coughs> is how attached their analyses are to Kurt's death. So I'm just gonna get this out of the way now. Every Nirvana fan has their own unique relationship with Kurt, his art, and his death including me. Going in, Kurt was the first rock star I was ever really fascinated with. I've told the story of 11-year-old me raiding my dad's CD cabinet before, that was in the Siamese Dream video. The Nirvana album I gravitated towards was never mined. Uh, in Utero was a little harsh for teenage me, which is ironic seeing as I gravitated most towards Siamese Dream, which is just this onslaught of noise. And my favorite track on Nevermind was Endless Nameless. So like, me not liking In Utero made no sense. Kurt interested me because he was such a contrarian, right? As sarcastic as he could be, he was also a self-destructive sweetheart. He cracked his heart open and poured it out for all of the world to hear Yet there was always a catch. His legacy is forever cemented as the tortured artist who never wanted to be famous. Ugh, I'm so angsty. Tortured artist? Sure. Tortured by the self-destructive cycles that consumed him his entire life. But it's a common misconception that Kurt never wanted to be famous. He just acted like he didn't because he came from punk music and didn't want to be pinned a sellout. He championed authenticity. Ever since he was a kid, the only thing he ever really wanted to do was play rock and roll music, but maybe he also kind of wanted to be a doctor if his collection of mannequins was any indication. But he was the one who pushed Nirvana to move from Sub Pop to a bigger label after Bleach. He intentionally constructed the image of this brooding, mysterious guy like John Lennon. The Messiah thing was bullshit, and he knew it. He got everything he wanted. He became the biggest rock star in the world. But he couldn't handle it because fame is not for nice people. Rock and roll is Saturn and it devours its sons. Kurt Cobain is exhibit A. There's also the misconception by conspiracy theorists that Kurt was happy, overcoming his depression, and did not want to die. First of all, the working title of this record was literally I hate myself and want to die. It doesn't get much more obvious of a cry for help than that. He was visibly unwell for days, weeks, months leading up to his death, but his inner circle didn't know to look for the warning signs because this was the 90s and they didn't talk about mental health then the way we do now. 
Hell, we still don't talk about men's mental health as openly as we talk about women's, even though the men's suicide rate is four times higher than women's. Missing the signs wasn't anyone's fault. Dave said so himself. They just didn't talk about that stuff back then. They didn't even really tell each other they loved each other. Forgive me if I can no longer be objective. As a person who talks about music, it is my duty to relay to you when I cannot be objective. Uh, what really gets me about the Courtney killed Kurt truthers is that they're all so insensitive. The vast majority of these people have never had suicide touch their lives. They don't know what suicidal people look like, act like, or operate like. They haven't had suicide touch their friends, their families, their co-workers, the people they went to high school with. And it shows. They have no empathy for survivors. They lob accusations at Courtney so fervently that the investigation into Kurt's death was reopened after 20 years. Can you imagine that wound being pulled apart over and over decades after your estranged husband and the father of your child died in such a horrible, traumatic way, at home no less. I'm not defending her because I like her, I empathize with her because I understand that scar being opened up when you least expect it. Of course his friends and family were in denial at first. No one wants to believe that a loving father could get to thinking that his daughter is better off without him. Of course Kurt had an astronomical amount of heroin in his system. He was a high-functioning addict. These people, they don't care to engage with the complex, non-linear ways that people cope with suicide and suicide attempts. You think Courtney killed Kurt because she threw herself into her work, acted out publicly, and frankly couldn't cope with her trauma? Fuck you. Fuck you. If that's honestly how you think, I don't like you. Yeah, pretty immediately after I was touched by suicide, was when I stopped believing that Courtney killed Kurt. After that, everything about Kurt's death and everything about the way Courtney coped made perfect sense to me. Anyway, back to the music, because if I don't get back to the music soon, I'm gonna get really angry. There's now lipstick on my finger. There's a burn on this one, now they match. Anyway, my favorite thing about In Utero is how raw it is. However, I do prefer the 20th anniversary mix. If you've been around here a while and you're familiar with my tastes, this won't surprise you. The 2013 mix was a radical restructuring of these songs that we know and love, and it even further champions the raw and the incidental. It all feels a little unstable. See the three stick hits before a wonky guitar chord, and that leads us into the rest of Serve the Servants in 4-4 four, four time. You're thrown off. Welcome to In Utero. Hey! Do you want to lie down? Do you want to lay down? You can stay if you lay down. I wonder if you're going to show up. You're, only your nose showed up last time. You're too small. Before we get farther and this inevitably becomes the Kurt Cobain show again, it's kind of par for the course, I want to spotlight this rhythm section because we truly do not give these guys enough love. Dave is on f***ing fire this record. Milk It has this metal-esque heavy-handedness that drives the tune and Nirvana's sound on this album as a whole. In radio-friendly unit shifter before he shifts into an almost melodic style. This picks up those guitar scratches before the song collapses in on its own inertia. And guys, we do not talk about Chris Novoselic enough, even though he 
didn't die at 27 and he didn't go on to form the Foo Fighters, he is just as essential of a component to Nirvana as those guys were. He gets overlooked so much because he's a classic bassist. He rarely doesn't do what the riff does. So when the guitars break away, we're left astonished by this rare harmonic touch. See Penny Royalty. His ability to craft a bass line too is underrated. See Radio Friendly Unit Shifter. He kicks that one off. Like I said, we cannot talk about In Utero without talking about Courtney. She was a huge part of this album's writing. She refused to let Kurt in on her songwriting process for fear people would attribute all of her hard work to him. Spoiler alert, they did it anyway. But Kurt welcomed Courtney into editing his work. This is some of the best writing Kurt ever did, and well, it's because he had another perspective. The main themes of this record are as follows. Apathy, anger, and women. We get those in order on the first three tracks of In Utero. Serve the Servants is all apathy. The thesis statement of the whole record, you could argue, Teenage angst has paid off well, now I'm old and bored. Then anger on Scentless Apprentice. Insert Kurt screaming here. But you can't fire me cause I quit is also of note. If I had a nickel for every time I covered a 90s songwriter weirdly obsessed with semen, I'd have two nickels. Which isn't a lot, but it's weird that it's happened twice. Scentless is the first really 90s dude bro riff here. I don't usually think of those when I think of Nirvana. I was turned off by this song at first because of the sheer dude bro energy, but then I just grew to love it. While Kurt screams for attention, I can't help but listen to the rhythm section. And the theme of women is introduced on Heart Shaped Box. This is my favorite song that he ever wrote. Weeks ago, I was lying in bed scrolling through Depop, uh, the changes and the solo of Heart Shaped Box were stuck in my head, so I decided to throw it on. And the strangest thing happened. I hadn't heard Heart Shaped Box in years, but before I could register it, I was singing every word involuntarily. My body was doing it before my brain registered it. Kurt's writing has that effect on people. As messed up as the imagery can be, his command over the word is truly hypnotic. All of Heart Shaped Box is hypnotic. That riff smells of opium. The lilting vocal melody, the woozy push and pull of Kurt's solo, the crashes of sound from when the rhythm section kicks in. It's fitting that I mention opium. The video prominently features the poppy fields from The Wizard of Oz. And as much as we don't want it to be, this song is about him and Courtney. Pisces and Cancer. When the macho dude bros that have populated grunge, that have mojo dojo casa houseified this Barbie dream house, claim Nirvana wasn't a feminist band, I laugh and I point them to this record. As a woman, Rate Me and Penny Royalty made me nauseous because they're just way too familiar. One in four women have experienced sexual assault. That number is probably higher considering all of the assaults that go unreported. It's probably closer to one in three. Existing as a woman in the world, there is a 33% chance that someone will take what is not theirs for taking. This line caught me. Rate me my friend. Eight out of 10 sexual assault victims know their abuser. And here's a line in Penny Royalty that a lot of critics have missed because, well, they're men. I'm anemic royalty. The narrator isn't just trying to induce an abortion, she's trying to kill herself. What happens when you're anemic and you miscarry? You bleed, a lot, and then you die. The narrator knows this. I'm not hailing Kurt as some rock and roll messiah. I'm hailing him as a bone-chillingly empathetic writer. I know Albini was bummed about not being able to mix the whole record, but the Scott Lit cuts are beautiful. As devastating as Penny Royal is, it strikes a balance of 
almost pretty. It's like being cut by a rose's thorn. I went into this thinking in utero was one of the most front-loaded records of all time. I mean, you have Serve the Servant, Scentless Apprentice, Heart Shaped Box, Rate Me, Francis Farmer, and Dumb all on side one. What is left for side two? A lot of hidden gems, actually. After a pretty hard-hitting A-side, the guys got to let loose and have fun with shorties like Very Ape and Tourette's and a phenomenal jam on Milk It. Very Ape is cheeky. I always get a little giggle about the line, if you ever need anything, please don't hesitate to ask someone else first. I feel that all the time. And I love Kurt's giggle on Milk It. He was the only one mic'd up in the booth, but I like to imagine the other guys pulling faces at him through the glass to make him laugh. I wish we got a little more of this endless nameless style off-kilter feeling from Nirvana, see this aimless noodling, and the use of feedback on radio-friendly unit shifter. Themes of apathy and women intersect on one of this album's shining moments, Frances Farmer. Frances Farmer was an actress from the 50s and 60s whose poor mental health plagued her all her life. The media was sexist towards her too, hounding her, accusing her of being a communist and oh no, an atheist. Mental health care was fucking prehistoric back then. She was no doubt abused in these hospitals. Uh, for a long time, it was believed she was lobotomized, but this was only proven false after In Utero came out. On a line like, I miss the comfort of being sad, we hear Kurt relating Francis's apathy to his own at the height of fame and fortune. Having Francis Farmer and Dumb back to back intrigues me. You have afraid of not being sad, paired with feeling uneasy when you're happy. These are common feelings you have when you're depressed. We take a trip down memory lane for Tourette's. It's the most punk sounding thing here. The whole record is a back to the roots excursion, but this is most obvious. Two of my favorite Nirvana tunes are on here. They're the opener and closer of this record. All Apologies is a rare, delicate moment. We've just come out of some of the craziest sh** I've ever heard, and now there's a cello? I think what I like the most about the lit mixes is the clarity and richness of the bass. Albini compressed the bass to hell, but lit gave it lots of space. You can feel the vibrations on the bottom strings, and there's this beautiful warmth from the cello. And we get one hell of a closing line for this record. All in all is all we are. Listening to the stuff Chris and Dave would make after Nirvana, Chris's quote from the beginning of this video is totally right. In Utero is a representation of all things Kurt. He had the most out there music taste of the three, it seems, and it reflects on this record's sound. In Utero still sounds so fresh today because it captures this group's incredible synergy. It's palpable. It lingers like static in the air and the smell of sulfur after a lightning strike. Yes, I've nearly been struck by lightning. No, I will not be taking questions at this time. It captures a band who genuinely loved playing with each other, who didn't take themselves too seriously, but ended up with a real heavy hitter anyway. It's irreverent, it's gritty, it's at times harrowing. It talks out of both sides of its mouth. It's as grotesque as it is gorgeous. 30 years later, In Utero remains brutal in its beauty. My personal favorites are Serve the Servants, Heart Shaped Box, Milk It, Penny Royalty, and All Apologies. Remember, if you want to keep up with all of the favorites from all of the Vinyl Mondays there ever have been, I have a Spotify playlist linked in my description. I update it every week. And that was the first Vinyl Monday of Season 3! That was In Utero by Nirvana. What do you think of this album? What do you think of Nirvana or grunge as a whole? Leave a comment letting me know. I love hearing what you guys have to say about the albums I love. And despite what some guy on the internet might tell you, your opinion matters. And if you like what I do here, you should like this video and subscribe to my channel. I post new episodes of Vinyl Monday every Monday morning at 11. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you guys next week. Bye!